Hello, welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and these are the special senses. So today for our bone of the day, we are going to look at the pelvic girdle that attaches your femur to your trunk. And then we'll be done with the lower limb and we can start looking at our axial skeleton. So this bone is called the coxal bone or the os coxa, and it's made of three fused bones. You're going to need to be able to identify your left versus your right os coxa. And we'll look at some bone markings that are, sh we'll show you how to do that uh, as we move forward. So the three bones that form the os coxa or the coxal bone are the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. The ilium is the big bone here that kind of, I don't know, what you feel is your hip bone in the front is um, your iliac crest. And so this big bone is the ilium. Your pubis bone is the little pointy bone in the front. So if you look here, Kelly can show us our pubic symphysis is here between these pubis bones. So, okay, well, how am I gonna know if this is left or right? This thing right here is an other marking. It's called the acetabulum. And that is where the head of the femur is going to articulate. So I have to put that, which way, laterally or medially? The femur is going to articulate laterally. So, okay, do I go laterally this way or laterally this way? Well, look, if I go laterally this way, I've got this really round region here and my pointy pubis goes to the back, so that's not right. My pointy pubis wants to come to the front and the acetabulum wants to go laterally. So this is a right os coxa or coxal bone. And this is the ilium, this is the pubis, which means this one back here is the ischium. What you're sitting on right now that feels like your butt bone is your ischial tuberosity. Okay, so let's look at the markings that we need to know. For the ilium, this is the iliac crest. And then you need to know the greater sciatic notch. And then you need to know the anterior superior iliac spine. And then you need to know the iliac fossa. So those are the bone markings that you need to know for the ilium. For the ischium, you just need to know your ischial tuberosity. And then you only need to know your pubis. So if there was a marker here and it said, what, which part of what bone is this? You would say, oh, that's the pubis of the os coxa. Or what bone of what is this? The pubis of the pelvic girdle. Something like that. Okay, so other markings of the coxal bone. The pubic symphysis you can only see when we have a whole pelvis. Uh, so that's the pad of fibrocartilage that we find between our pubic bones. So here's a whole pelvis. A pelvic girdle is different than a pelvis. A pelvic girdle is one os coxa that attaches one lower limb to your appendicular skeleton. Uh, to your axial skeleton. The pelvis is two os coxa and part of your vertebral column back here. So other markings though that you need to know uh, from your lab manual are the pubic symphysis, which here you can see is that pad of fibrocartilage between the pubis bones. So back here we can see our ischial tuberosities. Up here we have our ilia. What else? Acetabulum, we already talked about. That's the articulating surface for our femur. Uh, obturator foramen, so this is a big hole called a foramen. If you can ever come up with something as witty as obturator, obturator, I'll remember your name forever. I had this student, uh, rhymes with newest, and he came up with that. Obturator, obturator, that's the obturator foramen. So, and then sacroiliac joint is another one that you cannot see unless you're looking at a whole pelvis. So this is your sacrum. These, this is one ilium, there's the other. This joint right here is the sacroiliac joint. So yeah, you have to be able to identify that joint and the knee joint. So I think those might be the only two joints you specifically need to know. <clears throat> okay, muscle of the day. Let's talk about some things moving that thigh. So if you think about it, here is your um, os coxa. It's got a whole bunch of big muscles on the back of it. So I thought we'd just go over them. So gluteus maximus, you probably are all aware of, is this bad boy right here. Gluteus medius is deep to that, and gluteus minimus is the deepest 
and they're all kind of hard to identify on models. Gluteus medius is in here, and gluteus minimus is in here. And these are all thigh, um, they all move the thigh, which is here. So your gluteus maximus extends and laterally rotates the thigh. So what do I mean extends? If your thigh is flexed, then your gluteus maximus extends. So it helps, it's actually really forceful, it's really good for when you're going upstairs. Um, so it extends the thigh, and then it laterally rotates the thigh. So we said muscles always pull, they never push, so when it pulls, it laterally rotates the thigh. It also helps with thigh abduction. Uh, okay, so gluteus medius and gluteus minimus do the same thing. They abduct the thigh, and they actually help with medial rotation of the thigh. And so if you look, they would initiate abduction, so your thigh moves away from the midline. And then because of their strange attachment points inside the femur, like the greater trochanter area, when they pull, they actually immediately rotate the thigh. So just be aware of that. All right, let's do our muscle meditation. Close your eyes and breathe in gluteus maximus and breathe out extends and laterally rotates thigh and breathe in gluteus maximus and breathe out extends and laterally rotates thigh and breathe in gluteus medius and breathe out abducts and medially rotates thigh and breathe in gluteus medius and breathe out abducts and medially rotates thigh and breathe in gluteus minimus and breathe out abducts and medially rotates thigh and breathe in gluteus minimus and breathe out abducts and medially rotates thigh and breathe in and breathe out and come back to class. All right, so I just have a quick question for you. Get you thinking. Epithelial derived structures that reside in the dermis include A, hair follicles, B, fingernails, C, tactile discs, D, all of the above, E, A and B only. All right, the answer is A and B only. And if you say, hey lady, I didn't have time to think about it, then I would just say pause in wherever you're at and think about it before you push play. Because I don't have time to stand around and wait all day and then edit that stuff later. So the answer is A and B only. Why? Because these are epithelial derived structures that reside in the dermis. Why isn't this an answer? You might say, yeah, but the tactile cell is an epidermal cell. I would say, yeah, but the free sensory neuron that is touching it is not epithelial derived, it's nerve tissue derived. So yeah, A and B only. Okay, which of the following are considered special senses? A, gustation, B, olfaction, C, touch, D, all of the above, or E, A and B only? Yeah, you're right, A and B only. Why touch is a general sense? This is where we're going. So your book actually, I think, talks about vision first, but we're gonna look at olfaction and gustation today. The chemical senses, they're the most straightforward of our special senses, and we don't have a lab for this part. So next class, we'll pick up with the special senses of vision and hearing, and look at the eye and ear part of your brain eye ear lab. Okay, so our special senses are taste, which is gustation, smell, which is olfaction, vision, which is vision, and hearing and equilibrium. So uh, hearing is also called audition, and equilibrium is handled in your ear and has to do with your balance. So we'll talk about these two today, we'll talk about these two next class, and that will wrap up everything for your next exam. So. Olfaction and gustation are called chemical senses because the receptors that are being activated are chemoreceptors. So these use chemoreceptors. Now that's their classification by modality of stimulus. Where are odorants and tastins coming from? The external environment or the internal environment? The external environment, right? So from uh, receptor classification by location of stimulus, these would be what? Exteroceptors. So these are chemoreceptors that are exteroceptors. 
And we're done with all of our simple receptors. From now on, we're looking at our special senses, which use special sense organs. So the special sense organ for olfaction is called your olfactory epithelium. And your special sense organ for gustation is called a taste bud. Let's look at these, and they're actually very highly linked, these two senses. So 80% of your ability to taste comes from your ability to smell. So there are some people who lose their ability to smell a nausea, or maybe they were never born with it, and then they also can't taste uh, as well. So everything kind of tastes bland. All right, so we're going to start with the sense of smell. The sense of smell is the only special sense, the only sense for that matter, that does not have to go through the brain stem. Uh, and it doesn't have to go through the thalamus for you to be aware that you're smelling something. Now, if you really want to get into great detailed information about what it is you're smelling, some projections are going to have to go through the thalamus, but not all of them. So this is unique about the sense of smell. And the sense of smell is also quite unique because it is more potent for triggering memory and things than probably any of your other senses. And it all starts in the olfactory epithelium. So your olfactory epithelium uh, is kind of, this is the special sense organ, and it's located in the nasal cavity at the region um, that, if you recall, the superior nasal concha. And if you recall from, oh no, you don't recall. We didn't talk about this about bones yet because we haven't looked at the bones of the skull. Things are starting to make sense. I actually took out the bones of the skull and went back, to, <laughs> but maybe I should have left them in. So inside your nasal cavity, you have these bony ridges called nasal concha, and they're covered in this epithelium that um, is gonna have mucus so that we can trap debris and also so that we can trap odorants and we're going to breathe those odorants now anytime you're really trying to catch a whiff of something what do you do you sniff it up right you sniff it all the way up here to what's called your superior nasal concha and that's where our olfactory epithelium is located this bone here is called your ethmoid bone, and it's got what's called the cribriform plate, um, and it's all these little holes that you can see in the bone, and your olfactory epithelium is stretching up through those holes in that cribriform plate to make contact with your olfactory bulb that's going to take the smell information back to your primary olfactory cortex. So let's look at that. What the heck are you talking about, lady? Olfactory epithelium to so the superior nasal concha. And what we have there, let's say this is our bone. Is that what I want to say? It is. No, it's too close to other stuff. Okay. Let's say this is my ethmoid bone here. It's a really complex bone we'll look at later. But my olfactory epithelial cells, my olfactory receptor cells, are going to stick up through this cribriform plate area. And these are actually bipolar neurons. So you might recall that we said bipolar neurons were pretty rare. We found them in our eye, in our nose. Okay, well, here we are in the nose. And we've got these bipolar neurons. That is their structural classification. What would they be by functional classification? They're sensory because they're conducting sensory information. And what's interesting here is that these first order neurons are actually our sensory receptive cells. So just kind of be aware of that. We've got, so down here is our nasal cavity. And so we'll be breathing in air that has odorants that are going to get picked up by these um, olfactory receptor cells. And they are going to go up through the cribriform plate and synapse with these other cells called mitral cells. So, and there are supporting cells in there as well. But really what I am concerned of is the pathway of our sense of smell. So our receptors our chemoreceptors that are detecting odorants suspended in mucus. And 
And they are these olfactory receptor cells. And they are like our first order neuron, sensory neuron. And they are stretching up through the ethmoid bone and synapsing one of our next cells in this little structure called the glomerulus. And the next cells are called mitral cells. They are also bipolar neurons. And now their central process is extending, is that right? Is it their central, what do we call that? I mean, I guess that would be the peripheral process. Their <laughs> big central process that is taking the information back in this nerve is part of what we call um, our olfactory tract. So here, our neurons are extending away in the olfactory tract. Right here, we're synapsing um, on our mitral cells in this region called a glomerulus. And because we have all of these kind of synapses and glomeruli happening here, we get a little bit of enlargement right here. So this is actually um, called the olfactory bulb. So we could say our receptors are the olfactory receptor cells that are synapsing onto mitral cells in a glomerulus in the olfactory bulb. So receptors are synapsing onto mitral cells, and we'll just say in our olfactory bulb. And we'll let you know that it's enlarged there because we have all those glomeruli where that's all hooking up. So then from there, the information is gonna continue back in the olfactory tract to continue its conduction to your uh, primary olfactory cortex. So, as far as the physiology of smell goes, how do we activate our olfactory sensory neurons? Yeah, I see you, come on down. So we're gonna activate our olfactory sensory neurons when we suspend an odorant in mucus and it gets picked up by those sensory receptive cells. Hang on a minute. Okay, so how do we activate our olfactory sensory neurons? Well, we sniff an ear that has odorants and we suspend those in mucus, and then that is going to be the chemical stimulus that will cause depolarization to occur in those neurons. So we get an odorant suspended in mucus, And this is going to stimulate my olfactory sensory neuron, my olfactory receptor cell, the receptor. It's really the best, the olfactory receptor cell is what I like. Um, but you could also call it an olfactory um, neuron. Okay, so smell transduction, what happens now? How do we go, how do we transduce this signal from an odorant suspended in mucus to something that the nervous system can understand. What does the nervous system understand? Potentials, right? Depolarizing and hyperpolarizing events. So action potentials, most specifically. So how do I go from an odorant to an action potential? Well, this is one example where my odorant is gonna bind one of those G-protein coupled receptors. I'm going to activate a G protein that's gonna go activate adenylate cyclase and I'm gonna start kicking out cyclic AMP and that's gonna turn on a cation channel and now I can depolarize, okay? So that's how I transduce an odorant to an action potential, is by activating a G protein coupled receptor. All right, and then what? What's the olfactory pathway? Well, the olfactory pathway is one of the most confusing and that is because it's confusing. So, <laughs> yeah, why is it confusing? Because it does not have to go through the brain stem or the temporal lobe in order for you to be aware that you're smelling something. 
So usually we have a first order, second order, and a third order neuron, right? Where our third order neuron is starting in the thalamus and then synapsing in the portion of the cerebrum responsible for processing that sense. That's not what's happening here. We're going from one cell, our olfactory receptor cell, is going to tell our mitral cell. And then my mitral cell has those axons that extend in the olfactory tract, right? Right. Those are neurons that are going to be able to synapse right in the temporal lobes. And that is where we have our primary olfactory cortex. So I have one, two neurons involved in my awareness of the sensation of smell. Okay, so that is all that's required. Now I know you're probably looking at your book right now and the pathway that it's going through takes you all through the frontal lobe and all that stuff. Yes, that does happen after we get here. If you don't get here, you are not aware you're smelling anything. So from my temporal lobes, I'm going to be able to go a couple different places. So I'm going to start with my olfactory sensory neuron, who's talking to my mitral cell, who's sending an axon away in the olfactory tract, that's synapsing in my primary olfactory cortex, the temporal lobe. Okay, so where do I go from there? Here's my temporal lobe. This is now I'm aware that I'm smelling something. From here, I can extend a third neuron that can go immediately and synapse in the frontal lobe, right around here. <laughs> and now I can start to be aware, oh, I'm smelling bacon. Or so this is where you really start to differentiate what it is you're smelling. So I can go from the temporal lobe to the frontal lobe, or I can have a third neuron that goes from the temporal lobe to the thalamus, and then now another neuron that goes from the thalamus to the frontal lobe. And really that frontal lobe is where I'm doing all of my complex differentiation of smells. So if you're trying to like say, I don't know, do a blind smell test and smell between the difference between lavender and rose. Like, in order to differentiate those things, that information has to go to your frontal lobes and it's going to do it either directly from the temporal lobe or from the temporal lobe to the thalamus to the frontal lobe, okay? Smell is complex. All right, so that's what we're doing here in our frontal lobes is this is giving us our differentiation. So temporal lobes giving us awareness, frontal lobes giving us differentiation. Okay, that's one way that I can leave the temporal lobe is go to the frontal lobe. The other way that I can leave the temporal lobe is I can go to all of these things that are associated with fear, memory, emotion, salivation. So I can go from the temporal lobe now and synapse in the hypothalamus. This is where I can stimulate like a, sal a salivation reflex or something. Or if something is really gross, I mean, maybe I vomit. So smells can stimulate all that stuff. This is autonomic regulator. So yeah, I can go there. I can also go to the amygdala. This is in control of fear. So I don't know, let's say you, what would be an example? Oh, you, I don't know, skunks aren't aggressive. I was trying to think like, I was gonna use a bear as the example, and I was trying to think if bears are stinky. <laughs> so if you're afraid of a bear, you'd have more uh, potent memory if of the smell of a bear, because <laughs> smell is also being processed in the amygdala. That's not great. The limbic system is in control of your emotions. So this is what gives the emotional component. And all of this, the amygdala and the limbic system, are all like in areas where memories are controlled, or where memories are coming in and being processed. So I wish I had my brain model. That darn assistant took it downstairs and it's still down there. So deep in your brain, in the middle of your brain, you have these things called your hippocampi. And that is where memory formation is like occurring. And so the down near like the end of that are where your amygdaloid bodies are. And that's all your limbic system is all surrounding that. So smell is such a 
potent trigger of memories because it's processed in all of these regions. And think about it. We feel stuff all day long. You feel fabric on your skin from pretty much the time you're born. And so there's not like a memory of, oh, I felt this and now I remember like being born. But let's say you haven't smelled banana bread in years and then all of a sudden you walk into a house where somebody's ba baking banana bread and all of a sudden it'll like zoom, that smell will zoom you back to your grandma's kitchen where she made banana bread all the time. And that's because smell is so potently associated with emotions and with memory formation. And look at that, in order for you to even be aware of it, we don't have to go through the thalamus, which is also pretty cool. So that's like our exception to the thalamus and brainstem rule. And so I've got a quick question for you. All right, for the pathway of olfactory information to begin, odorant molecules must be suspended in fluid and brought to the receptors for this information. The system that is helping the nervous system bring this sensory information into the body is the blank system. A, integumentary, B, mucosal membrane, C, respiratory, D, all of the above. All right, yeah, C, respiratory. Now wait, you're like, wait, but what? What? Some people in face-to-face -face classes will say all of the above. How do I know that this is what they're saying? Because I make them hold up paddles with an A, B, C, or D on it. Not even a real clunker. They got these, they got paddles, they got little erasers, it's hilarious. And a lot of people would say, this, why? I don't know, because they're thinking of senses in the integument and they're like, well, it's got to come in through a mucous membrane, so it must be all of the above. No, the respiratory system is breathing in your air. And then it's getting caught in the mucus that's there in your nasal cavity and then being taken to your olfactory epithelium. So the answer is just respiratory system. Okay, sense of, woo, taste. So the sense of taste or gustation is actually 80% olfaction. What? Yeah. <laughs> Most of your sense of taste comes from your ability to smell. So taste and smell are highly linked. And if you think about this from an evolutionary perspective, it kind of makes sense. If you smell something that smells really awful, you're less likely to put it in your mouth. And so you can avoid like toxins or germs or poisons. So that kind of makes sense. And if you smell something that's really pleasant, Mmm, some of my favorite smells are McDonald's french fries. Not because they're good for me, but because my brain is like, oh, lipids, and it smells delicious. So, <clears throat> smell is huge, and it's really important even for your sense of taste. So taste buds are the special sense organs for taste, and they're found all across your tongue. And you'll see in your tongue, um, in your book, you've got all of these papilla, the different kinds of raised bumps around here. I'm going to need you to memorize each kind and um, where we find them. No, I'm not. That's a joke. Um, so, yeah, taste buds are found all over your tongue in papilla. And what are they? They're these interesting, like, spherical shaped structures that have um, what are called gustatory cells and then these, like, supporting cells. And they're, like, arranged in this fashion that creates what's called a taste pore. So just imagine this is a three-dimensional structure, not just my whiteboard on my wall, and that I've got all these cells wrapping around and creating a little taste pore. And the cells that I have in there are gustatory cells, gustatory cells, and supporting epithelial cells. The gustatory cells are the receptor for taste. And they are going to be hooked up to a sensory neuron that is running in one of two cranial nerves. What are those cranial nerves? The facial nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve, right? The facial nerve is responding to sensations from the front or anterior two-thirds of your tongue. And the glossopharyngeal nerve 
uh, responding to taste sensations from the posterior one third of your tongue. Your vagus nerve is responding to taste sensations from <laughs> back here if you vomit. But um, so let's zoom in here. So the anterior two thirds of your tongue, those taste buds are talking to facial nerve. Posterior one third of your tongue, those taste buds are talking to glossopharyngeal nerve. Your um, epiglottis here and your larynx actually has some taste buds so if you're vomiting your vagus nerve can be aware of that so that's pretty interesting okay so the receptor for taste are the gustatory cells the first order sensory neuron is a neuron that we find running in either the facial nerve or the glossopharyngeal nerve that's for taste from your tongue. Okay, so that would be my first order neuron. And that is going to synapse on my second order neuron in my brain stem, which is then going to ascend and synapse onto my third order neuron in my thalamus. And that is going to extend away to my primary gustatory cortex. Where is that? The insula. So that is where I'm now aware that I'm tasting something. So I've got my first order neuron is my sensory neuron in my facial or glossopharyngeal nerve. My second order neuron is my interneuron that's soma is in my brain stem and it's terminating in the thalamus. And then my third order neuron is an interneuron that is starting in the thalamus and terminating in my primary olfactory cortex, my insula. Okay. So, as far as taste sensations go, uh, we're aware of uh, several different types of sensations. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, um, umami, which is like that savory flavor in meat and tomatoes. And then there's a growing body of evidence that we might have taste receptors for lipids, which might be why I'm a slightly addicted, not really addicted, but like it's my one weakness at McDonald's is their french fries and it's because they cook them in this fat that's like meat enhanced oil. So you get umami and lipid in your flavor and they smell delicious and it's just like a hot mess of extra subcutaneous adipose on your triceps. Okay, so taste sensations. They used to say that eat different parts of your tongue tasted different sensations, but that's not true. You kind of taste things all over the place. Okay, as far as the activation of taste receptors go, what we're doing is we're suspending a tastent in saliva that is going to drop down into that um, taste pour and activate our gustatory cells. Okay? And then we're going to convert this to an action potential by opening different cation channels. Okay, facial nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve are then our first order neurons that are synapsing in our brain stem. And our second order neurons are synapsing in our thalamus. And our third order neurons are synapsing in our insula. Okay, now if I'm vomiting and I'm tasting that, then uh, my vagus is going to communicate that information to my medulla oblongata, who's going to tell my thalamus, who's going to tell my insula, and now I'm aware that I'm vomiting, whether I want to be aware of it or not. All right, we are almost done for today, and it may seem like a short lecture, and that's okay, it is. You have a lot of information for your next test. You've got brain, you've got spinal cord, you've got nerves, you've got receptors, you've got special senses, you've got the skin, well, the whole integumentary system. So take your time when you finish up today to go back through and make sure you're comfortable with all of that. Okay. When you eat, the sense of blank is most responsible for your perception of taste. I should have left in the A and B only answer because that would be the distractor. Most is the key word here. And olfaction is 80% responsible for gustation. So olfaction is most responsible for your sense of taste. And that wraps up our first two special senses. 
take a breath, smell the air around you, and I'll see you next time.